Today is January the 27th, 2016. My name is Tanya Fincham. Along with me is Dr. Charles Abramson, and we're, I'm with the library, and we're in Gunderson Hall here on OSU campus. We are here to talk with Dr. Perry Gethner. Mm -hmm. And this is part of our sub-series focused on Phi Beta Kappa, but, but before we get to that, we'll learn a little bit about him. So let's begin with having you tell us when and where you were born. Uh, I was born in Chicago uh, in 1947. And what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father was a pharmacist, my mother was a homemaker. You have brothers and sisters? Uh, none living. But growing up? Uh, I have one sister. And where did you graduate from high school? Uh, Von Steuben in Chicago. And what year? Uh, that would have been 65. Did you have a favorite subject? Uh, I really enjoyed foreign languages, mm. uh, so I took a lot of French and German. How did you become interested in that? Uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, I started taking courses and found I was good at them and enjoyed them. Well, had your parents spoken a different language? No. No? Grandparents? Uh, they did, but not around me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, it turns out it was something I was good at, and uh, then when I got to reading some of the literary works in both of those languages, I was, I was hooked. You were hooked. Well, did you participate in ex activities outside of school? Uh, in high school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly musical. Okay. And then at end, while you were in high school, were you anticipating going to college, or did it just happen? Well, I wasn't thinking too hard about it, but uh, I guess it was understood. <laughs> Not your first one in your family to go because your father had. My father had gone, yes. Right. Were they from Chicago? No, he was born in Russia. Uh, my mother was born in Chicago. Okay. Yeah, in fact, the families, from both sides of the family had come from Russia. Did you have to work during high school or did you choose to work during high school? Uh, not very much. I worked part time for my father. Mm -hmm. Did not choose to go into pharmacy? No, nor did he encourage me to do so. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So once you finished high school, take us through your educational mm -hmm. uh, path. Uh, yeah, I went to a small liberal arts college in Minnesota called Carleton, um, and um, it was a very positive experience, uh, the right kind of atmosphere for me, and uh, marvelous professors, uh, and uh, the. Uh, French professor I had my freshman year, uh, who was also the, the head of the foreign languages department, uh, was just sensational. So he became my undergraduate mentor. Well, how had you chosen to go to Minnesota? Um, the recommendation of a high school guidance counselor, because I really didn't have a clear sense of where I wanted to go. Did your parents take you and drop you off? Um, yes. Just drop you and leave you? <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How often would you go home? Um, just to school vacations. Distance-wise, about how far? Uh, it's a very long trip. Um, I've never actually driven it. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably will go to my 50th reunion and we'll see how long it takes to drive there from here. Uh, it, it's not, you know, right nearby. Well, from Chicago to there. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, shortly outside the um, the Twin Cities. Okay. And what year did you graduate from from there? Uh, sixty nine. Were you involved with activities there? Uh, yeah, quite a number of activities. Such as? And uh, I was involved with a lot of language clubs. Uh, in fact, I actually. Um, participated in foreign language plays. I was in two French plays and one German play, mm. among other things. And were you, you were inducted into Phi Beta Kappa there? Yes, I was. How, how did you become aware that that was a possibility? Well, uh, actually I didn't until I got the, the notice in campus mail. Mm. Uh, so it's, in that respect, it's similar to what we do here. Um, it's a secret process and the students don't apply, uh, the faculty committee uh, goes through transcripts and selects them. And your reaction? Uh, I was delighted, as was my family. 
you knew what it was? Yes. In, in those days, everybody knew what it was. Mm -hmm. Not like today, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so after that, where did you go for your master's and your, and your doctorate? Uh, I went to Yale. Uh, however, I did not go there directly. I spent a year uh, in France first, um, since I had not done study abroad. And um, so I was able to get um, a um, position as a um, lecturer teaching conversational English at French high school. Uh, in those days, the program was administered through the uh, Fulbright organization. Uh, today, it's organized by some other organization. I forget the name of it. Um, so that you weren't actually taking classes there, though you can audit them. So it's simply an, an enrichment exercise. Mm. So it was a very exciting year. Uh, then after that, I was drafted into the Army. Vietnam was going on. Okay. Um, so that took up the next two years of my life, and then I belatedly got to graduate school. So that was in 72. That you, that you entered or that you yeah. finished? Yeah, and it was, it was a joint master's doctoral program, so um, I finished in 77. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the Vietnam experience or, or not? Um, not terribly. No. <laughs> uh, except that um, ultimately I did not get over to Vietnam uh, because Congress slashed the military budget uh, as a protest against the president. Uh, and so um, people who were first-time draftees uh, got out a few months early so anybody who had been slated to go to Vietnam in that particular contingent didn't go. A little bit of luck there. Yeah. I guess. So I did, however, qualify for the GI Bill. I guess we should back up and then ask how did you finance your undergrad scholarship? Uh, my father took out loans. Okay. And then the GI Bill for... Yeah, that, that completely uh, took care of my uh, graduate tuition. Okay. Were you married any time in between no, those I was not. times? Okay. Just check it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've never been married. Okay. Well, how did you choose Yale? Um, actually, it was recommended by my undergraduate mentor uh, because for many, many decades it had been ranked as the number one French department in the country. Mm. So uh, I got in there and they accepted me and I said, well, I guess it's the place to be. Do you want to mention who the name of your mentor? Uh, yeah, his name was Donald Shear. He's since passed away, but we did stay in touch after, uh, after graduation. Okay. He had a, a major role in how you got here, I suppose, too. Um, yes, he was a major influence in my career. Mm -hmm. So once you, you graduated from Yale, when? Uh, in 77. Okay. Uh, but did not get a job. The uh, job market was terrible. So even people with uh, doctorates from Yale sometimes didn't get hired. So I stuck around for another year. I uh, had a part-time job at a local college, though that lasted only one semester. Um, simply because they didn't have a whole lot of openings. Um, I was able to do some part-time teaching at Yale, but uh, it was a rather difficult year. Uh, and I was continuing with uh, additional research projects at the time. Well, were you acting some during there in that time period? Uh, at that point, I actually had become um, active with the New Haven Opera Theater. I was singing in their chorus. Hmm. So I did some productions there. So a little bit of income. Yeah, though okay. that, that, that was not paid. Not paid, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you benefited in other yeah. ways. I, I did do a bit of singing professionally. Hmm. Had your parents, were they musical? Not very much. My mother a little bit. Hmm. Other than sing, do you play an instrument? Yes, I played the piano okay. and uh, do some periodic performing. Uh, just this past April, I did a lecture recital at the library. I missed it. I should have not. Should not mm -hmm. have done that. <laughs> well, from '77, and then when did you when did you come here? Yeah, '84. So, 
Yes. Yeah, so my, my fir- yeah, my first job was the University of Chicago. I had a tenure track job there. Um, uh, to the surprise of everybody in my own department, as well as me, uh, I did not get tenure uh, because the department had recommended me. Uh, so at any rate, I had to look around for other jobs. Uh, this one came along and I took it. So I arrived here in 1984, which I like to refer to as the year of George Orwell. <laughs> so over 30 years Yes. here. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Had you interviewed at other places, or was this the, uh, There the, were several other interviews. And you chose this one at Free Yeah, the, 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 there were two schools, and this one I thought was slightly stronger than the other, which was somewhat comparable. Hmm. And today, do you consider Stillwater home? or uh, Yes, I do. It's been, as you say, over 30 years, mm-hmm. you know, virtually wow. half my life. If you came in 84, they had already started the Phi Beta Kappa application process before you got here. There, there had been two application processes before, though I wouldn't know that till later. Okay. Um, and as typically happens, uh, once you're inducted into Phi Beta Kappa, you know that you've got the lifetime membership, but typically you don't do much with it. Uh, when I was at um, Chicago, um, nobody ever reached out to faculty. In fact, that's something we need to get back to doing here uh, when they arrive to tell them that they're you know, automatically members of the new chapter. Uh, so I had no contact uh, during those years. Um, and uh, so the, the absence of a Phi Beta Kappa chapter here, you know, didn't bother me. Uh, and that changed uh, a couple years after I got here. Um, when, as you already know, uh, Dean Stringer, who was chair of the Board of Regents, uh, happened to have a conversation with one of his law partners, in which Phi Beta Kappa came up, and uh, the feeling was, we really need to apply. Uh, so, at any rate, uh, I was tapped by the then Dean to head the committee, uh, because according to Phi Beta Kappa regulations, the administration technically is not the initiator of the request to get a chapter. The request officially is supposed to come from the faculty and staff at the institution who were themselves already Phi Beta Kappa members. So nobody in the administration was a member. They had to go through people's CVs to see, you know, who's who's a likely person to head this committee. Uh, So that's when it all started. And you weren't tenured at that time? Um, I think I, yeah, I actually came up for early tenure, and um, I think I would have just got tenure at this time. I understand it's a long process and a lot of work, so about the same time you were trying to to get tenure would have been challenging. Yeah, Um, but yeah, when I came here was put in my contract that since I'd already had, you know, six years in another school as as an assistant professor uh, and an extensive, you know, uh, scholarly and teaching record that would count toward tenure here. Well, when you say you got tapped, did you have the option of saying no? Um, yes, <laughs> but I said this is something really worth doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had no clue how much work would be involved, but uh, I said yes. And um, anyway, we went through the files and discovered there had been two previous applications, uh, and I started interviewing some of the people who have been involved in the previous applications, not all this happened right away, uh, to get a sense of what went wrong before. And uh, I don't know how much of this you want me to go into. Oh, as much as you want. I mean, what did go wrong before? Uh, in the 70s, and you know, I haven't found any paperwork on this, I've just heard, you know, anecdotal stories from people around at the time. Uh, the first application, uh, Phi Beta Kappa seems to have been looser then than they have become since. At least that's the impression I get. Uh, so the application was not as complicated or as long. And um, we got to stage three, which is to say the on-site visit. Um, something that would not happen again until, well, in my time until 20, uh, 2010. Um, and um, everything went well. The uh, people who came 
uh, or TAP from the national organization, uh, said that we were doing a respectable job. And uh, consequently, um, things look good, but it turns out that at that point we were under censure from the AAUP. Uh, there had been a case of a controversial speaker being disinvited, uh, which led to uh, all kinds of investigations and the feeling was that uh, we were not supporting academic freedom. Uh, at that point, censure from the AAUP uh, automatically blackballed the school. So the um, visitors said, get off censure and apply again. Uh, eventually we did. Uh, it helped that the then president uh, agreed to step down, and um, that was all resolved. Uh, so we applied again in the early 1980s, and uh, Bob Spurrier, uh, who had helped me along the way with the later application processes, uh, was in charge of things. Um, and once again, we got to stage three, uh, so we had the on-site visit, and this one did not go well at all. Uh, the people who came to OSU were uh, very snobbish. Uh, apparently when they were going uh, along Highway 51, uh, at that point you had the swine barn right on the, um, on the main road. Uh, that caused snickering. Uh, people were just very, very unsympathetic. Um, somewhere in my files I have a copy of the report they wrote on OSU. Uh, it was scathing. Uh, parts of it I think were unfair. Um, part of it, I think, it was justifiable criticism. Uh, they felt the faculty workload wasn't good. Um, that um, that the library uh, was seriously deficient. Um, there are lots and lots of things about the school, the administration of the school, that they were not satisfied with. Um, it wasn't a terribly helpful report. Um, I mean, they didn't give us any suggestions about what we could do better. Just a long, long series of negatives. Um, the, they, they did say, that in general, the quality of the faculty was good. Um, so everybody got discouraged. And uh, that is where things stood uh, when I got involved around 1987. Uh, and um, so we had our first effort, uh, I would, you know, the committee was struck and I had not realized how long the applications were, how complicated they were, uh, how intrusive the questions were, um, the amount of, in my opinion, a, a lot of, uh, you know, unnecessary data. But anyway, we got everything submitted in time and uh, what we ended up with was a form letter addressed to me uh, that basically said uh, not just no, but uh, that you know, uh, Phi Beta Kappa you know, receives more applications than it's able to accept, uh, and so they have to focus on the schools whose uh, values and ideals are most closely aligned with those of the association, uh, which I considered quite a slap in the face. Uh, again, there was no talk about how we can improve what, what they thought was wrong with us. So we were turned down to stage one. Um, the then dean, uh, this by the way was not the dean who picked me to begin with, uh, blamed me personally for the failure of the um, attempt. Um, mm -hmm. However, a lot of other people uh, thought that the dean actually uh, bear, uh, would bear a share of the responsibility. Uh, the campus had, let's say we did not apply at a very happy time for OSU. Uh, the campus was engaged in all kinds of turmoil. Uh, there were athletic scandals, which didn't put us in a good light. Some of these got national attention. Uh, there was another national black eye uh, when one of our uh, former athletic stars uh, went on national TV to say, say basically he was illiterate after spending four years at OSU. Um, and then we had a freedom of speech issue in which the uh, regents tried to uh, block the showing of a controversial film on campus. Uh, all these things got national headlines. Uh, there was even a big meeting which the faculty uh, expressed no confidence in the president of OSU. I'll never forget, it was the most exciting meeting I've ever been to here. Um, so it was in the middle of all of that turmoil uh, that we submitted the application. Uh, I should also point out there were a lot of faculty who were disgruntled, particularly the Dean of Arts and Sciences. 
uh, and the way OSU was going, especially because we've been going through a whole bunch of uh, not just these other crises, but also a budget crisis. Uh, there's a major downturn in funding um, in the mid 80s. So a lot of very unhappy faculty. Uh, I even found out that a number of people from various departments wrote letters to the Phi Beta Kappa headquarters saying OSU is terrible and doesn't deserve a chapter. Um, interestingly, I later found out uh, that in the previous application process, there had also been people uh, who'd indicated to Phi Beta Kappa that they thought we didn't deserve a chapter. Uh, I think I will not name names for this interview. <laughs> Um, were, they, all, were they members themselves? Yes. Hmm? Yeah, so they made a personal stake in this. Hmm. Um, in any case, uh, everybody was so discouraged that the whole effort was buried for a dozen years. Um, and then some good things started to happen. We had a new president. Um, we're talking about Jim Halligan. I think we deserve to name him. Uh, who was very good for morale, uh, helped you know, get more stability on campus uh, and a lot more respect. And um, we also had uh, some good things happen, uh, including our very first ever Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, and increasingly the Office of Scholar Development was being uh, formed, uh, so students are winning a number of other prestigious uh, U.S. scholarships. In uh, addition to that, we had in the late 1990s a radical reorganization of the Honors College on campus. Um, expanded uh, and um, major improvements in both quality and quantity. So we felt with all these good things going on, uh, it was time to apply to Phi Beta Kappa again. And we thought we really had a good shot. Uh, especially because the, the, the new dean at that point was himself a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He'd received honorary membership, uh, and his wife, um, who was working in the library, uh, was also a member of Phi Beta Kappa. So we felt, okay, this is the time to try again. Um, and we were shocked because, once again, in 2000, uh, I got this form letter uh, saying the same thing and giving us no critique. You know, this is what you need to improve on. And this time we were so puzzled uh, that contact was made with the national office. Uh, and so, at any rate, the OSU administration uh, actually sent me to Washington, D.C. Uh, to meet with the um, primary person at the main uh, headquarters. And interestingly, the uh, person who had just um, taken over the job, John Churchill, um, was from Arkansas, and his wife is from Oklahoma, and, uh, you know, he was very sympathetic, feeling that, you know, th this part of the country had been underrepresented. Uh, when he'd been a faculty member, uh, he'd led his school's attempt, and uh, they went through lots of rejections before finally getting it. So he was very, very sympathetic. And uh, so we got into a discussion of, you know, what we should be trying to do better, uh, and he definitely said apply again. Uh, so we applied again in um, 2006. Um, this time um, we were still turned down at stage one, but we got a lot more feedback. Uh, and there were additional meetings. Uh, I think Bob Grauman went uh, to meet with them, Bob Miller. Um, i trying to remember what stage President Hargis went to, to meet with them. Um, so more and more contact with the main office. Uh, which have become increasingly sympathetic to us and essentially saying, you know, we encourage you to think about the following things. Uh, so, at any rate, the 2009 application uh, was the one that went well. Um, but these, uh, every time we go through this cycle, the applications get longer uh, and more convoluted. Uh, I've sometimes referred to this as cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> uh, but Fortunately, we had a lot of support from the administration. Uh, we had good people on the committee. Um, so we made it to stage two. Uh, stage two, because this is a three-year multi-phase process, stage two involves submitting a second application even longer than the first one. 
mm -hmm. even more complicated. Uh, I was supposed to be on sabbatical that semester, but uh, ended up spending an awful lot of time working on the second round of the application. Um, and um, only a handful of schools uh, are allowed to submit it. It used to be maximum of 10, now typically it's a maximum of four or five uh, that get to stage two. And um, we got positive feedback. And so the message uh, in a phone call from the main office uh, is pretty much if you get through stage two, um, stages three and four usually uh, are guaranteed, but that, that's, you know, not official. Things could still go wrong. So stage three was the on-site visit. Uh, this is much more complicated than previous ones. Actually, five people came, and they were here for several days, and of course we had umpteen activities, uh, but everything went smoothly. Um, and um, There were a few tense moments at certain of the meetings, but uh, everything basically went very well. And um, you know, everybody on both ends behaved, I think, quite well. Um, and so the final stage uh, was the vote of the um, Phi Beta Kappa uh, delegates uh, at the triennial meeting, uh, which uh, that year was held in Florida in August. In what year? Uh, 2012. Okay. And... Um, at any rate, each uh, chapter, or I mean, each group that was up for a vote um, uh, was required to send at least one delegate. We sent a whole committee. Uh, mm -hmm. Burns Hargis, uh, in fact, was, was there himself. Um, so this is very, very dramatic. Um, and a number of fascinating things happened. It turns out that the then president of the Phi Beta Kappa organization, this is the president of the elected Senate, uh, happened to be the son of a former faculty member at OSU. So there was a connection. He actually been to Stillwater. Um, so uh, lots of things went well, uh, even leading up to the final vote, and we got it. Um, so uh, then there were a whole series of operations in terms of getting the chapter up and running. How did you celebrate that day when you... Knew you got it. <laughs> well, um, actually, um, President Hargis had chartered a uh, private plane to take everybody back immediately after the vote, which was on the Saturday afternoon. Um, however, according to the regulations, at least one person had to stick around for a special meeting the following day, that's a Sunday morning, with some of the uh, officials of headquarters to go through the procedures about the various steps of setting the new chapter up on your campus. So Bob Miller and I stayed an extra night, so we went out to one of the local restaurants to celebrate. Good. <laughs> um, so it, it was very exciting. What had the university done in that last push to actually get it? Um, there were a number of things that uh, were going on. Um, one of the most important, I think, was the commitment of President Hargis to the establishment of an art museum on campus. I mean, that, that really helped. Uh, plans for the eventual construction of a um, performing arts center. Um, expansion of the headquarters for the radio station KOSU. Um, a lot of those address the cultural yeah, side Yeah, the of cultural campus. side of things. Uh, and the fundraising uh, efforts uh, to um, increase the number of endowed chairs on campus. Mm -hmm. So um, well, I mean, the, the, those are some of the main things that, that help to um, move it along. Move it along, yes. Well, the library was an issue for a denial early on. Mm -hmm. How, what were some of the things they did um, to improve that part? Yeah, there was a definite feeling that uh, library resources, um, particularly the um, construction of remote storage facilities, uh, availability of uh, electronic databases, um, a lot of modernization of the library since the 1980s, um, you know, improvements in the amount of study space available, um, um, 
a big increase in the general uh, number of um, overall number of volumes in the collection. Um, it's interesting. In fact, there were actual uh, passages in the uh, final application about uh, you know listing uh, journals, including journals in foreign languages that the library subscribes to. Mm -hmm. uh, the proofreading job uh, going through all those lists was quite horrendous. That's interesting to see those changes happening in the library, but not knowing mm -hmm. really the the motivation or yeah behind some of them so and you know we had some wonderful leadership at the library in those years so when you you came back to campus after this trip to Florida mm -hmm. did the group get together then and congratulate each other or anything like that uh no no <laughs> uh but there was a meeting called um, early on in the fall semester uh, of the Phi Beta Kappa membership uh, to elect officers uh, and go through the uh, the plans. Okay, they said that. And also uh, arrange for um, possible dates for the official installation ceremony which eventually took place in January of the following year. So all of the principal officers from national uh, as well as all of the people who are on the on-site visit committee, the Committee on Qualifications. Um, and then, of course, we had a big dinner for everyone and um, uh, a reception at the President's house. It was uh, all quite exciting. Once you had done all that you could do, mm -hmm. you just have to turn it over and say, okay, I'm not touching this anymore? Uh, well, the day will come. Oh, uh, you're not there yet, huh? <laughs> no. Uh, according to the uh, this is interesting. One of the things that we had to do immediately uh, in preparation for the installation ceremony uh, was to uh, adopt uh, a constitution and bylaws. They sent us uh, a template. Uh, basically, we had to sort of customize and keep it at least 98% to what uh, they had written. Um, so anyway, I was elected president. Uh, and uh, presidents and vice presidents are term limited, other officers are not. So I have been elected to a second term, so uh, at any rate, my term will come to an end um, in uh, 2017. How long are terms then? Two, uh, years. two years. Two years. Yeah, everybody's first term was extended. Still had work to do. Yeah. Has there been m much support from other other Phi by the Kappa members on campus to help? Um, yeah, a certain number of people have um, been very supportive, have shown up to events. Uh, we have several active committees. Um, Roughly how many faculty on campus are, are members? Are, are members yeah. uh, about 60. Okay. Um, well, past 2017, do you anticipate staying involved? Yes, according to the bylaws, uh, the past, immediate past president is a member of the executive committee for at least one year. Okay. So you can't retire anytime soon. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the ceremony for, for yes. the, January, the January ceremony? Um, well, it was held in the um, auditorium in Oak Central. Okay. And, um, Any particular reason why? It was felt that would be the most appropriate place. As the Honors College? Uh, as the Honors College, uh, and also where the first OSU graduation took place back in the 1890s. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and it, because it's a beautiful room. It is. So at any rate, people were there in their regalia. Um, um, if you were president, who were the other uh, officers? Or? Uh, Bob Miller was elected as the vice president, uh, Gene Halleck as secretary, uh, Jonathan Comer as uh, treasurer, and Charles here as uh, our historian. Okay. So according to the um, bylaws, those are the, the five official officers. Okay. That was, the process was over, if they started in the 70s, it took... Over 30 years? It took over 30 years. Um, I mean, I was uh, involved um, 
for almost a quarter of a century just you know, my part my participation in this. Mm. What kept you motivated? Well, um, I actually felt this was something really important. Um, first of all, um, everybody agrees that having access to this particularly prestigious organization is great for the students. We're only really talking about a, a tiny fraction of, of the top students who are eligible for this. Um, and the students who deserve it, you know, are entitled to uh, membership in the most prestigious uh, academic honor society in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a badge of honor for OSU indicating that we do something right in terms of educating the students in the major um, arts and science disciplines. And I'm assuming language is one of those? Yes. And that may, that has probably been an issue throughout the whole process. Did we have enough, offer enough in that area? Um, that was certainly a question. Um, sometime in the 70s or 80s, um, and of course since I was not active with the uh, society at the time, I don't know when precisely this happened, uh, they actually pushed through uh, specific requirements in math and foreign languages. Mm. Uh, the requirements had always been that um, it was not simply GPA, uh, though that was one of the factors involved, uh, but that a faculty committee had to go through every transcript individually to make sure that at least three quarters um, of the coursework uh, counted as what they would consider serious rather than frivolous and that there should be a degree of intellectual breadth as well as rigor mm. in what the student did. Um, so, personally, I'm not thrilled by having these you know, special foreign language and math requirements, uh, which are quite rigid. Uh, even though with foreign languages, we are, shall we say, more flexible than what national would like. Uh, I think the um, local chapter should have a bit more flexibility. But, um, well, for a time period, was computer science considered a language, foreign language? Uh, no, not for purposes not of Phi Beta purpose. Kappa. Uh, a lot of departments on campus would consider it uh, as a foreign language for purposes of either um, foreign language requirement for the doctorate uh, or, in a few cases, for the undergraduate degree. Hmm. So as, as a Regents Professor, your career is full of achievements. Mm -hmm. How does bringing Phi Beta Kappa to OSU rank among them? Um, that's definitely my number one legacy to OSU, along with my teaching. Um, you know, this is something important. Um, and I suppose the other thing I should mention is that uh, I've set up an endowment uh, to contribute uh, to the functioning of the chapter. So I pledge a substantial amount of money to that. Mm. So that will also endure as, you know. Uh, because one of the things that uh, I seem to recall when I was inducted, uh, unless my memory is playing tricks with me, uh, is that the chapter picked up the fees. I didn't have to you know, write home to my parents saying that we need this money. Um, what we've done up until now is uh, the students um, basically have to pay, um, used to be $55, it's gone up uh, to national, plus whatever fee the uh, local chapter charges to defray the cost of the ceremony. So um, first couple years it was $75, now it's 85 It may go up again. Um, however, I did, um, when I notified the students that they were accepted, uh, I said that if uh, people have a financial hardship, uh, they can contact me um, and uh, I would try to arrange to pick up uh, the cost through my endowment. But, uh, you know, there's not enough in that particular endowment to help out with more than, you know, seven or eight students per year. Mm. You know, we couldn't uh, subsidize everybody. Uh, Dean Stringer has since has set up an endowment of his own. Uh, primarily for the purpose of paying for all student memberships. And um, though um, I still have to talk to um, 
our treasurer and our financial uh, consultants in, in Whitehurst. Uh, but I believe that there is enough money in his endowment uh, that as of this year, uh, we can subsidize all the students and nobody will have to pay. Well, roughly each year, how many students qualify? Uh, about 20. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever go above 30. Mm. Or are there more that actually qualify than don't know that they do? I mean, or just, who, who takes on that responsibility to make sure that those who do meet the requirements actually get considered? Uh, that is the president and the uh, committee. Uh, and the committee is appointed by the president. I was saying to Charles, because I'm in the process right now, reconstituting the committee for this year. Um, but do they go through every graduating? No. Uh, no, what, what, what I do is I uh, contact the registrar's office every spring semester. I've just done this a couple of days ago. Um, with a document called the stipulations document. That's 5A to campus term online. Uh, and this lists what sorts of things, essentially we tell the registrar's office, please send us a list of students, you know, who uh, have achieved this many credit hours. Essentially they've, they've got senior status, that doesn't mean they're going to graduate in the next semester or so. Uh, a GPA of uh, our minimum is 3.7. Um, and have all the other, a uh, whole bunch of other things that we require. So then they send us a list of names that comes to me. Um, then the next step is, since I have the list of who is inducted already, but the registrar's office doesn't have that, uh, I have to go through their list and check off the names of people who are already members. So um, yesterday, I received the list, uh, so this is stage one of the process, there were 53 names. So six of them are already members. So obviously we're not considered them again. Uh, of the remaining 46, there are 10 people whom we considered last year. And two of them we rejected, the others we accepted, uh, and they didn't join. So I will talk to the committee um, and ask whether they think that these other people should get a second chance. So once uh, the committee has weighed in, I will get back to the registrar's office and ask them to send the transcripts for just these particular students. Mm -hmm. So there'll be at most 46 transcripts that we will go through, as opposed to say about 900 and some people on average who graduate each year from the College of Arts and Sciences. And still 43 is a, a, a large number to go through with a yeah. one tooth comb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that they would choose not to join because they didn't have the money, or, or uh, would be other I, I don't think it was the money because in my uh, email to the students, you said you uh, as well as the help. paper letter, well, I think it was just in the email that um, if there's a financial problem, they should let me know. They just don't understand. Yeah, and, and several people did. Um, yeah, one person uh, actually declined after I'd spoken to him in person, and he's majoring in my department. Uh, and I was really quite shocked. Uh, the other people simply never responded. Mm. Now, one of the problems we know is that there's so many of these honor societies floating around nowadays uh, that the students have never heard of, they don't know one from the other. And they don't realize that only a couple of them are really legitimate. Mm. Some of them are essentially bogus. Um, and this, this one is worth joining. So a little bit more education? Yeah. Informing people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I am hoping that, um, you know, I'll be proposing that we have uh, maybe the uh, Arts and Sciences magazine or maybe the uh, OSU magazine uh, an interview with Dean Stringer. Mm -hmm. um, now that uh, his endowment is up and running. Mm -hmm. So again, get, giving us a bit more name recognition. Well, it's still relatively new since it was yes, just it is. Mm -hmm. two years, three mm -hmm. years. And this year, I think, it's the 240th anniversary of the whole thing. Uh, yes, it was founded in 1776, which is an easy date to remember. Mm -hmm. So maybe tie into that for mm -hmm. your pub, for yeah. information this year. Mm -hmm. hmm. 
So looking back for when you joined yourself back in the 60s, mm -hmm. did you envision having this type of role? No. Fast forward 50 years? No. Um, one doesn't have a very clear sense as an undergraduate what's involved, except we know this is a big honor. Right. Uh, it's basically something you put on your resume and you know you don't think about doing something with the society after that. Well, on, on your resume, has it have you noticed a difference? I mean, in those years you, you weren't employed, it didn't seem to help? Um, I don't know whether anybody noticed it on my uh, right. resume when I was applying for jobs. And the whole situation was different, too, at that yeah. time, so mm -hmm. we'll scratch that question. <laughs> Do you remember your secret handshake? No, to be perfectly no, honest. I, I still remember mine. Yeah. You, had, you had a secret handshake? Oh, yeah. Yeah, huh. yeah that's yeah. a hangover from the um, founding of the uh, organization when they were a secret society. Uh, and I did not know why it was a secret society until I actually read the, there's a whole book on the history of Phi Beta Kappa. And uh, the reason why it had to be secret was students did not have academic freedom. It's also the reason why they had to meet in a tavern off campus. Essentially, this was a debating club uh, and a discussion of serious ideas, as opposed to just a drinking club, just a social organization. Um, and they would often get into controversial topics. One, one time, they actually discussed slavery. And this, we're talking about Virginia in the 1770s. Um, so they would not have been allowed to talk about any of these things on campus. So that's why they were officially called the Secret Society. And then the secret handshake would have some yeah. lot of significance. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. hmm. Was it the same for everyone? Or everyone? No, no, because I'm not supposed to reveal the oh, secret yeah. handshake. Uh, I, assume oh, okay. <laughs> I assume it's the same for everyone. <laughs> when, you're, uh, when you became Phi Beta Kappa, you, I'm sure, your, of course, you said your parents are very, very happy. Yes. Did they do anything special? I don't recall. It was a long time ago. Because yeah. mine, you know, my mother's buried with my uh, original Phi Beta Kappa key. Mm -hmm. She thought that was like, the best thing I could ever do. Mm -hmm. was, uh, Did they add something to the diploma? Like a... Uh, not for us. I don't think so. It might have been mentioned in the program. Well, does it show up on the transcripts? No. No? Hmm. Yeah, I don't think it, you know, it's been a long time, I don't think. Uh, I mean, some diplomas will say Kumo Sumati or whatever. Yeah, but, that, that, but that's, that's conferred by the school, whereas the Phi Beta Kappa is not. Okay. It's a private organization okay. based at the school. It seems like it ought to with all that work that you put yes. into it. Mm -hmm. Should have. Should have. <laughs> well, moving forward, what do you anticipate for the, for the chapter? Well, I really don't know. Um, Obviously, one of the challenges um, is to try to keep up a number of activities. Uh, one of the primary activities is an annual lecture series. Um, and, um, last year, we um, had a uh, competition that we uh, sponsored uh, during uh, Campus Research Week. Um, well, can you lose your chapter once? I mean, did they According to the Constitution, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are actually procedures in place for revoking a charter. Uh, though I actually contacted National Headquarters about this. They said that this has been on the books uh, since I think the 1930s, uh, but it's never been invoked. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you have to keep up records and keep up the, ac the application active. Uh, no, but we are required to submit an annual report to National. Okay. That's one of the principal jobs of the secretary. Okay. Uh, and they will ask us um, things like, you know, how many students, you know, uh, did you accept for membership? Uh, how many accepted? Uh, what activities did you do? Uh, what was the attendance of these activities? Things of that nature. Well, as new faculty are hired, is that something that that comes up too to see? Yeah, that's have something it? we need to work on. Um, to see if we can actually get the word out at some kind of new faculty meeting uh, to let Phi Beta Kappa people know that 
they should be you know in touch with the officers so we can include them on the mailing list. Mm. It, it takes up a little bit of your time. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to ask, Charles? Just to say that it's a real pleasure working with you on this. And I, you know, personally, I consider it one of the highlights of my career. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's been great having you on the team. And you would say that's a, you would say that too that this accomplishing yeah. this was one of the highlights. Yeah. Hmm. Do you want to mention a couple of other highlights since you're you, you've had you've risen to the top and slowing down a little bit? Well. Um, I want to get into a bragging competition. No, that's not. Uh, but uh, yes, I was uh, promoted to Regents Professor a few years ago. A big, a big honor. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I have um, an endowed chair. Um, so uh, I have had recognition on campus in terms of my you know, scholarly work. I have been very productive. Mm -hmm. Any plans to retire? Uh, probably next year, though, you know, it could be postponed. Mm. But I am getting older. <laughs> and will you stay in Stillwater? At this point, probably, yes. I don't have any other plans or places to go to. So when you consider home, it's, yeah. it's here mm -hmm. and not back to Chicago? Yeah, I don't think I could handle the winters there <laughs> uh, after more than three decades living in the South. <laughs> and there's not that much of my family left there. Well, OSU's been lucky to have you, sounds like. Thank you. So I appreciate you sharing your stories with us today. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Sure.